brave of me to come after that musician here <laughs> and uh, hope to lecture you about economics and hold your attention. But here I am. I want to talk about something that each one of us sees every day. It is sites such as these. These pictures are from my travel. They are always from my study or of a local place. You must recognize this. <laughs> and it's a place where you can buy almost anything. Food, a product, a service, even God. I'm talking about the informal economy. I've been researching the informal economy for well over a decade now. And even today at dinner parties or when I meet new people um, and when they learn what it is that I do, the question isn't how interesting or why that. It's almost always this. I know, it is such a huge problem, right? So how do we formalize it? If by the end of today's talk, I can convince some of you that our obsession with formalization is not healthy, not wise, I think my job here is done. I have two points to make. First, challenge the notion of informal economy as being deviant and therefore the bane of society, and talk about informality as the new driver for change. So let's start with definitions. What is informality? It's a negative definition, which means it is characterized by the absence of formal rather than the presence of its own defining features. So what does formality and informality mean in terms of an economy? Basically, it refers to the allocation of resources. In a formal economy, the resources are allocated by the state. Think socialist government, think taxes. Or if it's a market-based economy, it's heavily regulated. There are checks and balances with regards to what can be traded, in what quantities, what should be the mandated quality, who should produce, consume, and distribute it. And for most part, these rules, these checks and balances, are based on the norms of the society. For example, medicines should be state-approved, prescribed only by those who are qualified to do so. Alcohol should be sold only to adults. And cars should come with working brakes and airbags. It's just largely good sense. But what I'm concerned with is what does not fit into this idea of formality. And that gets left out. So what gets left out is things such as these kinship-based exchanges, so the gifts you exchange at a wedding or during Diwali or Christmas, foraging and redistribution in a tribal society, and markets outside government norms. By the way, you should surely check out this guy. And what this tells us is that people fulfill their needs through various means, and not every transaction can be formally accounted for whether it's through torrent downloads or paying someone in cash for a service they have rendered or buying a branded item which has been produced in a sweatshop in Nigeria or Bangladesh, each one of us are associated with the informal economy in one way or the other. But when we hear the word informal economy, what comes to mind is words such as these. Shadow economy black market, tax evasion, smuggling, child labor, drug cartels, crime syndicates. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not for child labor or smuggling, but what I'm trying to tell you is that this is not the whole picture of an informal economy. Informal vendors are more like this guy who set up his shop right in front of the no hawker zone. Scholars who are researching the informal economy are of the opinion that informal is not necessarily illegal. Okay, 
And that's largely because it's out there in the open. So you get my idea that that guy is not the Sith Lord. But you must surely be thinking that this is a fringe. It's not as important as the mainstream economy, so why should we care about it? And you're right. You're right in the sense that most economies right now are capitalist. Capitalism is the dominant form of organizing economies right now. And all of them are regulated to some extent. You would be hard pressed to find an economy or a society that's largely organized informally. But let's look at some alternate evidence. Robert Neuwirth, one of the foremost experts on informal economy, presents us with some contrast. This is the luxury economy. It's worth 1.5 trillion USD annually. That's a lot of money. That's like three times the GDP of countries like Sweden or Belgium. And that's the economy that gets written in the Forbes magazine that Bruno Mars sings about, right? But if we were to put the informal markets of the world together as one nation, as one economy, that would be worth 10 trillion USD annually. That's even more, right? Just to give you another perspective, that would be equal to or more than actually, the GDP of United Kingdom, France, and India put together. That's how large the informal economy is. And these are actually a conservative estimate of the fastest growing economy that we don't exactly know how to measure. And this data is from 2012. Unfortunately, that's the latest large-scale data that we have available on informal economy. And that's not all. UN statistics tell us that two-thirds of the global workforce is employed in the informal economy. That's 66% of the global workforce. And that number gets even bigger when we get to the developing countries. It's somewhere between 85 to 90%. And in countries such as ours in India, it's 93% of the workforce that's employed in the informal sector. Globally, ILO tells us that four out of five enterprises operate out of the informal economy. So why is it that so many people choose to stay out of the informal formal economy? Is it for tax reasons? Yes, some. But most of these people don't even make as much money to fit into any of the tax brackets. So is it a case where government does not have a handle on how to regulate these sectors? Let's have a look at the policy options. So there have been largely four policy choices when it comes to dealing with the informal economy. First, drive them out, literally. It is the raising of the slums and programs like slum clearance, which drives out hundreds of thousands of uh, informal inhabitants out of their homes overnight, burned down. It's, a, it's kind of a phrase where not in my backyard, not in my problem phase. The second one is make them pay up. That's introducing steep fines to deter informality. And it would work well for people who are rich and informal. But what about those who cannot pay and are therefore informal? The third option is improve them. These are programs like slum upgrading, which introduces basic amenities in the slums, or microfinance programs, which introduces or injects finance and credit into these informal economies. And the fourth niche scholarship is about expanding the informal economy. Why? Because right now, it's the only viable option we have of getting people out of absolute poverty. So research on informal economy has come a long way from something like this, where both sectors were treated as independent watertight compartment 
to something such as this more intertwined, where both the sectors are considered as two ends of a continuum, and each one of us and our enterprise somewhere along the line dotted. Now this, of course, is a random allocation. But what I propose is a much more nuanced model, something such as this. So I might be a registered firm, formal, but my tax compliance might be so-so. My way of hiring employees might be people in my family. My payments, I accept both cash and digital payments. My organizational structure, I have none. The way I gather information about market and products could be also informal. So let me give you another example. A builder or a developer in India right now will not dare start construction on a housing project before he has all the building permission. But once he gets the building permission, he might make minor modifications. It all depends on what he thinks he can get away with. Things like reducing the length of the swimming pool or increasing the parking area. It also depends on which one is cheaper, stalling the construction to get new building permission or bribes. Sometimes, stalling the construction can take up to six months. This is what economists call transaction cost. Let me give you another example. In the informal sector, it's people such as these, the informal vendors, who may choose one form of payment, such as Paytm or phone pay. But on other parts, they are completely informal. They might not have a vending permission, or they might not even be a registered enterprise. So why is a nuanced model so important? Why am I stressing on it so much? I think it's because it closes the divide between us versus them. Us who are in the formal sector, and they who are part of the informal sector. It unites us in the idea that we choose conformity to institutions based on our convenience, need, and affordability. In other words, we choose formality when it's value for money. Value need not be monetary all the time. But for those who live in poverty, they may not have a real choice. If it makes earning a living harder, they have no option but to discard formality. Having said that, I don't think equating informality with poverty is correct. That's because there is a lot of divergence and heterogeneity in what is labeled as the informal economy. And that brings me to my second point, that informality will be the driver of change in the coming times. I think the reason we should care about informality is not because it employs a majority of the population, not even because it contributes so much to our economy. I think the reason we should care about it is for what it represents, a divergence, a deviance from the mainstream ideas. We are standing at the cusp of change. Our world is increasingly being termed VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And I believe at such critical junctures, ideas for change will necessarily come from the unorganized informal sectors. Because the old ones, the old formal order, is no longer working for a majority of the population. To give an example, I have taken up these concepts. Your shared economy, Uber, Ola, Airbnb, co-working spaces, Gig economy, which is characterized by casual contracts rather than permanent jobs. Minimalism, focusing on reuse and recycle. Veganism, which rejects the commodity status of animals. Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, dabbawalas. These ideas cannot come from complete compliance to a formal system. If you were to follow any of it, you would know that these are ideas in rebellion. Now these ideas may have problems, and for each one of these good ideas, there'll be many 
that never took off. And that's precisely the point. Formal systems are hard to change overnight. We can see for ourselves how long it's taking our governments to act on climate change or get rid of plastic or petrol cars. Informal spaces, on the other hand, have more room for trial and error. I want to end with this note. That the formal and informal sectors are the yin and yang of a balanced economy. We cannot avoid formalization. We need norms for predictability and stability. And inevitably, some of those norms are going to be institutionalized or formalized. There is marriage for companionship. There are universities and schools for education, banks for credit, and hospitals for healthcare. But shunning informality and wanting to convert it into the formal sector at all costs ASAP is not wise. Wisdom lies in accepting informality as an equally inevitable part of our lives and our economy, especially in times of change. Thank you.